Um, this is such a, a, a sacred time for us on the Christian calendar. And the importance of this week and the events of this week from 2,000 years ago, th those importance can't be overstated. Jesus entered Jerusalem amid the shouts of Hosanna. And we began our service this morning reading about this particular event in the gospel, both in English and in Spanish. And I want to remind you briefly what John said in John 12, 13. They gathered branches of palm trees, which is why you have palm branches in the pew near you. And uh, I'm looking for Sharon, but I, I'm, I'm going to make an executive decision. You can take those home, okay? <laughs> if, if I'm not supposed to let you, then I guess it'll come out of my check. But uh, you can take those home and uh, let it remind you uh, of, of this week. It's the beginning of a sacred week, and so maybe, maybe put it up in the doorframe or something. Um, but John said they gathered branches of palm trees to wave as they celebrated his arrival. And they were shouting, Hosanna! He who comes in the name of the Lord is truly blessed and is king of all Israel. And then Matthew tells us, and I'm reading from the message uh, this morning, it'll be on the screen and in your notes in the back of your bulletin. It says, nearly all the people in the crowd threw their garments down on the road, giving him a royal welcome. Others cut branches from the trees and threw them down as a welcome mat. Crowds went ahead and crowds followed, all of them calling out, Hosanna to David's son. Blessed is he who comes in God's name. Hosanna in highest heaven. You know, there were thousands of people coming to Jerusalem that weekend. There were thousands gathering for the Passover feast swelling the population of Jerusalem almost overnight to some, some historians saying two to three times its normal size uh, of population. So, so imagine, imagine if, if in, uh, if in the, the, the Bay Area, all of a sudden you had three times as many people show up uh, over, over a weekend, what traffic would be like and what, what, the, what the causeways and roadways would be like. And it wasn't just crowds, but dignitaries were showing up. Uh, the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, was coming into town. Uh, the Jewish puppet king, Herod, he would be there too. And in fact, there would be a lot of element of pomp and circumstances as uh, celebrities and the wealthy and the powerful came to Jerusalem. But none of those events are recorded when they all arrived. But when Jesus arrived... The cries of Messiah and shouts of praiseful adulation were being lifted up, not for politicians and not for monarchs, nor for the wealthy or the powerful, but the acclaim was for Jesus as he entered the city that day. Palm Sunday is the commemoration of that day. We call it the triumphant entry or triumphal entry, depending upon uh, your particular uh, uh, bent of, of, the, of the Christian faith. As he came into Jerusalem that day, it was one of the most unique celebrations in all of Scripture. You see, you need to remember something about our Lord. And for those of you that have studied the Gospels, you'll be reminded, the Lord did not allow himself to be the pawn of political struggles. He did not allow people to make him king before the time. He didn't allow people to define what his kingdom would be. He didn't allow people to make him uh, king for their own ambition's sake. But on this day, on this day, in fulfillment of prophetic revelation and as an acknowledgement that God had chosen him and that the kingdom was indeed his to fulfill what Zechariah had said, to fulfill what Daniel had said, to fulfill what, the, the, what David had said. On this day, by entering Jerusalem this day and in this way, he was claiming legitimacy to the throne of David. So he not only allows the celebration, but he receives it. First and only time. Matthew 21, 9, it says, the multitudes who went before him and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus on this day is inviting the people into what Lewis would call the divine dance. He's inviting them into this sense of celebration, this sense of fellowship, this sense of intimacy with God. To worship Jesus in our image is to not worship him. 
Let's say that again. To worship Jesus in our image is to not worship him. To worship Jesus in a way that we want to is to not worship him at all. You and I have been called to enter into that fellowship, the fellowship of Christ the Father, or of the fellowship of, the, of Christ with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. You and I have been called to enter into that sacred place. You don't get to define how things act there. He defines it. You don't get to determine how you will worship. He determines it. That's why Jesus would tell the woman at the well, true worshipers must worship, worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Those are the kind of worshipers that he is seeking. But to worship the Lord in the fulfillment of divine revelation, when you have a, 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 an unveiling of your eyes and you see Jesus for who he is, the sacrifice, the Messiah, the king, the anointed king of the ages, the full actualization of the scriptures, to worship him this way is to worship him in spirit and truth, and it's absolutely necessary. The only proper response of creation at the revelation of the creator is to worship. It is the only appropriate response you have to celebrate him in the beauty of his holiness. Please note also that on that day, the worshipers were not dependent upon their, uh, upon their skill sets necessarily, their musical ability, their oratorical ability, they worshipped him with whatever they had, but they worshipped him with fullness. Tree branches were cut down. Cloaks were taken off and thrown. Voices were raised. Arms were celebrating. The young were worshipping. The old were worshipping. The rich were worshipping. The poor were worshipping. They all finally knew, even for a fleeting moment, that the king was in their midst. And they had to worship him. Luke tells us this, a huge crowd of disciples began to celebrate and praise God with loud shouts, glorifying God for the mighty works they'd witnessed. A crowd of disciples said, the king who comes in the name of the eternal one is blessed. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. Like everything that our Lord does, is the great poet king. Palm Sunday is a beautiful revelation and yet a mysterious paradox. The carpenter's son enters Jerusalem as Israel's king. The obscure rabbi from Nazareth, whom they would say, can anything good come from Nazareth, enters the Passover celebration as the, its most famous visitor. The mighty God capable of destroying the world and the universe in which it dwells with a mere thought, rides humbly on a donkey. In this light, I want you to consider two simple thoughts this morning as we begin Holy Week and we commemorate and consider Palm Sunday, the ministry of the invisible displayed in the realm of the visible. The first thought is this, number one in your notes, and that is the, the tragedy of the triumph. Palm Sunday speaks to us about the tragedy of the triumph. We call this day the triumphant entry or the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem. Even though Christ allowed himself to be celebrated as king, that wasn't the primary reason for him coming to Jerusalem. Even though this was the fulfillment, the same date that the Israelites would cross the Jordan River into the Promised Land under Joshua is the exact same date that this takes place. He's fulfilling ancient promises. He's fulfilling ancient prophecies. He's fulfilling Zechariah and Daniel and others. He's fulfilling all of these things. But his primary reason to go to Jerusalem is not to have palm branches waved at him. His primary reason to go to Jerusalem is not so people can shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, although they must. In fact, Jesus himself said, if they don't today, the rocks will cry out. 
But his primary reason, as Luke would say, that he set his face toward Jerusalem. It was not so that people could applaud him. It was not so that people could celebrate him. It was not to be hailed as king of the Jews. It was not to be hailed as king of the Greeks or king of the Romans. He's king of kings. He doesn't need your praise to be that. His primary reason for going into Jerusalem that day and his primary reason for going into Jerusalem this particular week was to die, was to suffer. Palm Sunday tells us that Good Friday is coming. And his reason for going into Jerusalem was a tragic one. You say, tragic? How can it be tragic? It purchases our redemption. Would you please remind yourself for just a moment that Jesus coming to suffer and die is the greatest tragedy because it is the, it is the ultimate destiny of humanity's failure and fall. Humanity's fall would have its most hideous act displayed in the supreme injustice of the absolutely innocent dying for the absolutely wicked. You say, well, I'm not as wicked as that guy. Or I'm not as wicked as that one. The illustration in the, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, cantata, the, the drama earlier, the, those who would stand in judgment on the woman. Well, we're not as bad as she is. And that's how humanity comforts itself with, well, I'm not as bad as he is. That's the wrong question. The question is, are you as righteous as God is? And since you are not, all have failed. The most tragic event in human history is the horrific crucifixion of Jesus the Christ. John said in 1 John 4, real love isn't our love for God, but his love for us. God sent his son to be the sacrifice by which our sins are forgiven. God sent his son to be the sacrifice by which our sins are forgiven. In all of human history, it is unlikely that anyone has ever thought up a more brutal form of capital punishment than crucifixion. Nothing compares to the brutality of it. Before Jesus is even nailed to the cross, though he suffers all kinds of intense physical and emotional agony, after being exhausted from mockery trials, being exhausted from the, from the intensity of Gethsemane, the prayer in Gethsemane, Gethsemane means the, the place of crushing. He's arrested. He's, he's handed over to the Sanhedrin, falsely accused. He goes before Pontius Pilate. He goes before Herod. All of these things. So finally he is condemned. He's blindfolded and beaten. He's mocked and he's scorned. A crown of thorns is placed upon his head. He's ridiculed. He's scourged. No mere whipping. The Romans would use a, 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 a whip, an apparatus, or a whip rather, that had nine different, called a cat of nine tails, had nine different leather straps. In the straps was bone and metal and lead. And the, the, the metal and the bone was for tearing and the lead was for bruising. And so every stroke would be, would be uh, uh, nine strokes. And it was the Jews who had the, the, the moratorium about 40 minus one, so 39. But in Christ, the, the beating was 39 times nine. He was a bloody pulp. This is why Isaiah, from the passage Dr. Monty read earlier, would, 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 would prophesy and say, many were appalled at him. His visage, his, his appearance was marred more than any human being. He didn't look like a person anymore. Beaten, then forced to carry a heavy cross up a hill. He fell and Simon had to carry it for him. Then they crucified him, which, was, which is a pulling of the arms out of the, out of the, out of the joints. And crucifixion ultimately is death by, by suffocation. This is why they broke the thieves' legs to hasten death. But when the soldiers pierced Christ's chest cavity, water and blood flowed because his heart had exploded. Never done anything wrong. Not in word, not in thought, not in deed. But Paul said it was when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us. True love is sacrificial because true forgiveness is costly. 
I'll say that again. True love is sacrificial because true forgiveness is costly. It exacts a toll on the one who's been hurt, offended, robbed, or abused. Christ triumphantly entered Jerusalem to tragically die for the tragedy of humanity's plight. To sacrifice his life for the broken, the wounded, the afflicted, and the afraid. But also, but also, he didn't just die for the victims of sin. He died for the perpetrators of it as well. This is the great mercy of God. That not only did he die for the broken, he died for the brutal. Not only did he die for the afflicted, he died for the vile. Not only did he die for the ones who had been victimized, he died for the wicked. Not only did he die for the humble, he died for the rebellious. Palm Sunday is a day of triumph when Pharisees scorned him, when children laughed, when men shouted, when women celebrated for various reasons and motivations. But Christ knew the moment and he knew the tragedy of the moment. This is why in, in Luke 19, he, the, the, the gospel writer records for us that when he approached Jerusalem that day, that Sunday, when everyone is shouting, everyone is waving palm branches, everyone is singing his praise, everyone is applauding his name, that day he looks at the city and he weeps. He weeps. How our Lord must weep over the stubborn, rebellious, arrogant, self-referencing, self-sufficient, immoral morality of our humanity. When he has offered himself as our hope and our remedy, in this foreshadowing of the cross and the empty tomb, the majesty of the king and the humility of the servant, the vulnerability of the sacrifice and the mediation of the priest all come together in one moment. And there is the beauty of the Savior, the grace of the Redeemer, the mercy that is the healer. For Jesus himself said of his own mission, the Son of Man comes to seek and to save what is lost. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So Palm Sunday should remind us of the tragedy of the triumph. But it should also remind us, number two in your notes, of the triumph of the tragedy. Hallelujah. It is almost as though the whole gospel is being played right out in the most tangible of passion plays that day. Right in front of Jew and Gentile alike right in front of Roman and right in front of Jewish people. Here comes Jesus, king of the ages, king of the world, dying for humanity, dying for Jew and Gentile alike. Everything comes down to this particular week. And on this particular day, when humanity cannot approach God, When we were lost and we could not find our way, when we groped about in darkness and we could not save ourselves, the king came to us. Matthew 21 says, see, your king comes to you. Hallelujah. You know what, beloved? Jesus wasn't lost. You and I were lost. And the king came to us. He found us. Romans 5, 6, again, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us. Our God, our king, he met us. He came to redeem us. He triumphed in the midst of the tragedy. Colossians 2, which we read at the beginning of service, verse 9. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. Verse 13, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled, hallelujah, the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He took it away. Nailing it to the cross. Every sin is a transaction. Every sin takes something from someone. There is no such thing as me doing something my way and it only affects me. That's the biggest lie in the universe. It's the biggest lie in the universe. Sin affects others. Your sin, my sin, our sin, it affects others. 
People have told me, especially when I was a youth pastor, well, why couldn't God just forgive us? Why did Jesus have to die for us? Because you have a God who is supremely merciful, but he's also supremely just. And sin left a debt, and that debt had to be paid. I've shared this illustration before. Say you were driving in the back parking lot here and you ram into my car. Will I forgive you? Maybe. <laughs> Capital M, maybe. Eventually, I'll get there. Say, Diego, running back there and drives into my car. And he comes to me, Pastor, I'm so sorry. I, I hit your car. Will you please forgive me? Yes, I'll forgive you, Diego. But, 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 but. Someone's got to pay for the damage. Now, either he could pay it or I could pay it. And the, the silliness of this generation is, oh, it's free. Just let the insurance pay it. Oh, no, that doesn't affect any of us. <laughs> when I moved to Oakland from Southern California, the day I changed my zip code, my insurance doubled. It affects us. It affects all of us. Well, think about sin. Think about the tragedy of rape. Think about the tragedy of violation. Think about the tragedy of murder. Think about the tragedy of thievery. Think about the tragedy of injustice. All of these things cost all of us. And that, and that debt is so large, it's staggering. The toll that it takes on all of us is staggering. There is no such thing as a victimless crime. There is no such thing as a victimless sin. There is, these things affect all of us. And ultimately, for God to just wave his hand and forgive sin without having it paid for is not only beneath his integrity, it means that he's unjust. If you've been the victim of a crime, if you've been the victim of a sin, one of the things that brings consolation is the sense of justice. Because there is within even our fallen moral compass this sense of right and wrong. So how could God look at the tragedy that sin is and you say, oh, I want him to forgive so and so, and I want him to forgive such and such, and I want him to forgive this person and that person, but not that guy. Not that woman. This is how we look at it. Well, God looks at the whole, and he sees the staggering debt of it all. He sees the overwhelming debt of sin. He sees the overwhelming tragedy that sin is. He sees all the cars hit and someone's got to pay for it. And so what God has done is come into the circumstance and come into the situation and say, not only will I forgive it, I will remedy it. Not only will I forgive your sin and throw it as far as the east is from the west and remember it no more and not hold it to your account, I have the power to take what sin stole from you and return it back a hundred times. I can make it whole. I can make it right. I can make it pure. I can make it just. I can make it beautiful. I can make it right because of my son. He took it away. Hallelujah. So let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever sinned? I need to see more hands than that. How many of you sinned more than once? How many of you sinned so many times that you can't even count them today? Yeah, it's exactly, okay? That's us. And we can make light of it a little bit, and we should a little bit, because, you know, it's that, well, we're imperfect, etc. But the fact of the matter is, all of those things have caused struggle for somebody else. They've caused harm. They've caused wounding. They've caused, my impatience has caused wounding before. My anger has caused wounding before. 
all of these things. Only Christ can take all that you've done and all that I've done and nail it to the cross, crucify it, bury it, overcome it by rising from the dead. So what God did is take all the sin in the universe, all the sin from Adam and Eve to whoever the last person is, he took all that sin and he nailed it on Jesus Christ. He put it on Jesus Christ. The one who knew no sin became sin. And he nailed it to the cross. Hallelujah. So that, verse 15, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing. Hallelujah. Triumphing over them by the cross. My friends, the almighty God, the magnificent redeemer, the beautiful poet king can take something as tragic as the cross, something as horrible and tragedy as the cross and make it the triumph of righteousness, the glory of Christ, the restoration of humanity. Is it any wonder that the writer of the Hebrew letter would say, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you'll not grow weary and lose heart. If there is ever a word for you and I today, it is that phrase right there. Consider him. Hallelujah. Consider him in the middle of your struggle. Consider him in the middle of your loss. Consider him in the middle of your suffering. Consider him in the middle of your illness. Consider him when the news is so bad that you don't want to open the mail. Consider him when the news is is so overwhelming that you think I can't make it another day would you stop and consider the one who triumphed over everything by the cross hallelujah get your eyes a little bit higher get your focus a little bit deeper consider him hallelujah hallelujah look what Paul said to the Roman church we're confident that God is able to orchestrate everything. Hallelujah. Orchestrate everything. Orchestrate everything to work towards something good and beautiful when we love him and accept his invitation. Oh, my friends, in the middle of your sorrow, in the middle of your loss, in the middle of your pain, in the middle of your sin, he is still triumphant, gloriously, victoriously, confounding his adversaries, overwhelming the darkness, and bringing the dawn of his glory and his grace. What a savior you have. What a redeemer you have. The great advocate stood in silence as the Sanhedrin railed against him. He refused to defend himself in Pilate's court. He refused to entertain Herod's curiosity. He as a lamb before her shears is silent. So he was silent. He was silent when one word, one word in his own defense would have silenced his accusers. Hallelujah. One word in his own defense would have brought 10 legions of angels from heaven. One word in his own defense would have mocked the mockers. One word in his own defense would have destroyed the rebels. One word would have made his escape. But no, hallelujah. Even as the overwhelming enormity of the task and skated down upon him, crushing the man Christ Jesus, he said, your will be done. Hallelujah. You see, my friends, this was his work and his alone. No one else can save you. No one else can redeem you. You can't save yourself. You can't redeem yourself. Only he can do it. There is no other man. There's no other woman. There's no other angel. There's no one in heaven. There is no one on earth. No one could take away the sins of the world. This was Jesus' task alone. Listen to me. For a brief moment in history and for an endless moment in eternity. For a brief moment in history and for an endless moment in eternity. Once and for all time. Every sin ever committed or every sin to be committed was laid on Christ. 
And the weight of it was staggering. The weight of it was overwhelming. It was so profound that he would cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But when he got to the end and the account was paid in full, he said, it is finished. It's settled. It's done. It's over with. It's paid for. He died the death. He buried in a tomb. And Palm Sunday reminds us that there's a tragedy in the triumph, but there's a triumph in the tragedy. Because he didn't stay there. He rose again. He lives. He lives. He lives. He lives. He lives. No wonder Paul would tell the Philippian believers, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. So somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. No wonder he would tell the Philippians the verse of scripture we read in the beginning. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself of no reputation, emptied himself. Kenosis is a theological term. He took all that glory and he set it aside and put on the form of a man and being found in human likeness as a man, he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Hallelujah. Therefore, God has exalted him to the highest place and given him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. 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 This is why. This is why. It's tragedy and triumph. But triumph overcomes the tragedy. Hallelujah. Because you have a Savior. You have a Redeemer. So quit walking about in the doldrums. Stop that old life is hard stuff. No kidding. This isn't heaven. But heaven's coming. You have a savior. You have a redeemer. I know life's hard. I know things are difficult. I know sometimes the news from the doctor is so bad you don't even want to hear the you don't even want to hear it. I know. I know, but dust yourself off a little bit. Stand up a little bit. Square your shoulders a little bit. Your Redeemer lives. Hallelujah. Your Redeemer's alive. Hosanna has come. Save now has come. The most liberating thing you can do is to worship him in spirit and in truth. It is the most liberating thing you can do. Don't get me wrong. I believe deeply in prayer and intercessory prayer, and there's times you just cry out to God. I, I, no question. But I'm also thoroughly convinced that if we spent twice as much time worshiping as we do anything else in our religious, spiritual disciplines, not only would we live a more fulfilled life, we would see him more accurately. And in seeing him more accurately, more grace flows and more power is available. This is Palm Sunday. This is the day of his triumph. This is the day of his tragedy. This is the victory of the king for all eternity. It tells us the king came to us when we couldn't go to him. The lamb died on the cross when we couldn't die for ourselves. The priest made intercession when we couldn't pray for ourselves. And he rose again, triumphing over death, hell, and the grave. Live victoriously, because you have a victorious king. Stand with me, please.